are some of you that I see some familiar faces, Zach and uh, Adam. Yeah, there's Sam. I saw you. Um, some of the Belarusians might have had me in religion before. Um, but anyways, before I go into who, who I am, you know, like my wife and beautiful kids and stuff, I'm going to kind of go into who I am spiritually. So I start with uh, a reading from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. You probably know this parable, um, but for me, it's whenever I hear it, it always speaks to my heart and always, um, I don't know, it always reminds me of my journey. So then he said, a man had two sons and the younger son said to his father, father, give me a share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his adherence on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck the country and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself to, out to one of his local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods in which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat, but here am I dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. His father ordered his servants, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. This parable is of the prodigal son. For you, those of you who do not know me, my name is Matt Gibson. Um, I am 42 years old. I am married to Melanie Magato. We grew up in Rushi. This is my family. Of course, this is my beautiful wife, Melanie. This is my 12-year-old daughter, Ava. My uh, interesting thing about Ava is um, we have been trying to conceive for three years. You know, kind of up and down, you know. Well, are we pregnant? No. You know, well, for three years we went through that. And we went to church, and it was the Feast of the Immaculate Conception and um, Holy Day of Obligation. So we came home, and it was our day to kind of check to see if we were, you know, we thought, okay, let's check to see if we are pregnant. And we found out that day that we were expecting our first child. So, in honor of our Blessed Mother, Ava's middle name is Maria. So it's of Ave Maria, it's Ava Maria. So, um, Therese is my 10 year old daughter. She is named after Saint Therese, of course, one of my favorite saints. Um, this is Joseph. Um, of course, and talk about Saint Joseph. My first son's going to be called Joseph. So, um, you'll see why. Um, anyways, Joseph Gerard, um, and kind of Saint Gerard being the patron saint of expecting mothers and kind of with thanksgiving for prayers heard. He was named Joseph Gerard. This is Catherine. Um, she's five, just started kindergarten. She is definitely our fireball. She's 100 miles per hour all the time. <laughs> she's kind of, she has that, that smile of uh, like a firecracker. So um, Catherine Faustina. And then this is Dominic, Dominic Thomas, um, St. Dominic, which um, I'll talk about Marian consecration, but uh, St. Dominic was definitely someone that was very instrumental in bringing us the rosary and the meditations. So 
in honor of him, Dominic Thomas. And Thomas is actually my confirmation name. And my wife had a uncle who was mentally handicapped. His name was Thomas, and he died the week. It was going to be the week that I uh, proposed to my wife. So he died the week before, so I postponed it a week. So um, he was a kind soul and was my wife's favorite uncle. So in honor of him, Dominic Thomas. Um, someone that's not pictured there, and right before we had Dominic, um, my wife miscarried for the first time ever, and um, for us it was it was devastating as it is for anybody who goes through a miscarriage. Um, we found out right before Christmas, and my wife she wrote this poem, and we didn't know if it was boy or girl. It was so small. Um, I mean, we she actually passed the baby through, and it was I mean, little little Francis, what we named him, was about real small um, and around Christmas so we named them we didn't know it was a boy or girl we thought Francis would be kind of a good name Francis Emmanuel and so my wife wrote this poem and we, we had a little casket and buried them uh, Father Fox came out and did it for us and I'll leave this up here if you want to read it um, I'm not going to read it because I guarantee I'm going to cry so um, if you want to read it while I keep talking that's fine um, but anyways for me, it was definitely a great pro-life moment. Um, I mean, I, I probably, when we found out that the baby had died, um, I, I probably cried 10 minutes straight. I never went through something like that. And so for me, and for my whole family, it was definitely hard. Um, but we do now, We every morning when we say our prayers, we ask St. Francis Emmanuel to pray for us. So we consider him or her our little uh, saint in heaven. So, um, anyways, I grew up in the little town of Yorkshire, Ohio, which is not far from here. Um, I grew up and there's, basically there's my house. One side was a post office and the other side's a bar. And my dad worked at the bar. So you can imagine kind of the things I saw as a kid. Um, but anyways, it was downtown Yorkshire. Um, that's where I grew up as my stomping grounds and my I had a bunch of guys we kind of hung out together and stuff and did you know played football basketball you know run through the creek whatever um, my dad always called us the Yorkshire nerd herd so <laughs> you ever hear that I want a coffee right here that'd be a great t-shirt or something um, but anyways that's where I grew up um, I graduated from Versailles High School um, in 1996 so that's like 25 years this year um, I graduated. I went to Wright State University for a little while um, that, but uh, then I eventually graduated from Sinclair Community College with an associate's degree in personal computer applications. Um, I moved to Rushi right before I got married. Um, so that's about 17 years ago um, which we got married in July of 2003. So, um, I am a member of the St. Remy Catholic Church um, I had been a religion teacher for 13 years. Um, the last couple years I had quit because we had Dominic and I wanted to have that extra night at home. Um, as I explained one of the guys here, um, my wife and I both work, so the extra time is important. And I loved teaching religion, but for me it was a step I had to take at this time. I definitely look forward to going back and teaching. It's something I love to do. I don't know if I was good, but I love doing it. So. Anyways, um, I am a fourth degree member of the Knights of Columbus, and I was Grand Knight of our uh, St. Remy Knights of Columbus Council in the past. Um, for about 10 years, I served every Saturday morning for Father Amberger and Father Fox, uh, served Mass. Um, funny thing, when I went to, when I first became Catholic and I went to Father Amberger and I said, hey, you know, I'd like to help out the church in some way. I'm about 25 at this time. And he's like, well, you know, I can really use a server on Saturday mornings. I'm like, is that what the young kids do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I said yes, and to me it was one of the greatest blessings I've been given as a Catholic. Um, 
was definitely learning how to serve. I eventually learned how to serve the extraordinary form. Um, I learned it with Adam's brother, Ethan, and Eli Putoff, which would be, a deep, they're, they're both in seminary. Um, but we learned when Father Amberger put it back in the, the high altar there at St. Reed when they renovated. So, um, so I did that for a while. Um, and here I'll actually show you a picture of that. There's Father Amberger, this bald headed guy is me. <laughs> um, some other guys. That's a point. I'm not sure. That's probably Ethan, I'm guessing. So, but anyways, um, this was at a funeral for one of my friends' daughters who died at six months. We did a high mass. And one of the, a great blessing I was able to serve that. So, anyways, a uh, picture of that. Um, but the, he, today I'm here to talk to you about my journey with God and over the last 42 years and how I found myself in the Catholic Church. Um, I also will talk about my favorite saint, St. Joseph, and how he's affected my life. Um, I grew up raised in a Lutheran faith. My family and I would attend Sunday school and worship every Sunday. Um, I was president of the youth group at St. Paul Lutheran Church just outside North Star, Ohio. That's kind of where my mom's family grew up. Um, like six generations of my mom's family grew up in that area. Um, as a kid, I always wanted to play St. Joseph in the Christmas pageant. Um, as a Lutheran, he didn't really talk about Mary and Joseph much. You just heard him in the, the Nativity story. Um, but I, I always wanted to play Joseph. And so I got to play it one year. And then the next year came, and they decided they were going to do somebody else. Um, of course, me being a spoiled brat, I whined and cried. And I got the part again. <laughs> Not a proud moment, but a great love for St. Joseph, even back then. Um, anyways, uh, I played that, or my, going into that, my Lutheran faith, growing up Lutheran, um, I got to give credit to two people that formed me to be, a, I felt like a good moral person at that time. And this is my... Grandma and Grandpa stuff. Well, it's my mom's maiden name stuff. So this is my grandma. She was a beautiful soul. She, I talked to her about baseball for hours. I loved baseball growing up. And she was from Boston originally. So if you ever see me with a round with a Boston Red Sox hat on, I'm really a Reds fan, but it's in honor of my grandma. She was such a great soul. She died when I was like 12. And again, there's a theme going through this talk. I'm a crier. I cried like crazy when my grandma died, which most people do when they grandma they pass away. She was a beautiful soul. She could sing. I mean, she's, she used to sing opera back in Boston where she grew up. Um, and then she met my grandfather during World War II. He's from North Star area. Followed him back to North Star and became a farmer's wife. So my grandpa, like I said, was a World War II vet. Interesting story about him. My uncle told me this later. Um, and he was on one of the battleships over around Japan in the, the Pacific, and they were getting attacked. And he was a, he was just a medic, um, not really doing any. He wasn't on the you know doing any really fighting, but they got attacked. So when he you know they're you know under fire and so forth, and he's running through the halls, and this this old man that was on the ship with my grandpa told my uncle this. He goes, "You're." My uncle said, your dad, my grandpa, went and was grabbing guys by a shirt and said, get up and fight. God wants you to fight. So to me, he, he had great courage and had great stories. He could talk your leg off. Just a wonderful example of good moral people. So um, to, to him, if somebody asked me who's my hero, that's my grandfather. To me, he was my hero. And he was a faithful man, so was my grandmother, and two of his brothers were actually Lutheran pastors. And I, my mom told me, she goes, well, when you were baptized, she goes, you smiled when you were baptized, and I always thought that meant that you were going to be a Lutheran pastor. <laughs> Boy, is my mom probably thinking about that right now. Um, but anyways, um, that's beside the point. Um, 
you know, I was, I was proud growing up of my Lutheran faith. I had, you know, many Catholic friends. Um, some of the girls I dated were Catholic. I'd been to Mass with them. Um, and I remember sitting there thinking while I was going to Mass, you know, I'd hear the Hail Marys during the Rosary, maybe before Mass, and thinking, you know, why are they saying these prayers over and over again? And I just sat during the whole Mass, not saying a word, and just with this big chip on my shoulder thinking, man, you guys got it all wrong. You know, during my high school years, I was a good kid. You know, I, I didn't go out party, I didn't drink, I didn't do any drugs, I wasn't, you know, doing anything illegal or anything like that. Um, next picture. I forgot to tell you, I work at Globus Printing in Minster. <laughs> so I, I printed these. That's why I, I didn't have these specially made, I specially made them myself. This is me in high school. Um, Again, I had way more hair. I'm not, I can't see it under the hat. But I, I'm not someone that's like a great athlete or anything. But the one thing I could do was pitch. That's one thing I will brag about. I could pitch. I love to pitch. I started when I was like 11 years old trying to be a good pitcher. And um, I took a lot of pride in it. So um, as a so much for my opinion. <laughs> Anyways, um, as a varsity pitcher, well, I had a really good team. We grew up, we went to state semifinals as a junior. No, we had state finals as a, when I was a sophomore. And as a senior, we went to state semifinals. And I pitched. I was a, one of the starting pitchers, and I was undefeated that year. So I take a lot of pride in that. The only thing I was good at, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, um, okay, so. You know, I, while I was in high school, I also, you know, I was on the National Honor Society. Um, you know, I, I graduated with honors. I got good grades. It's like 11th out of 123 kids. So I was a studious kid. I tried to do well, tried to keep my parents proud of me, so forth. Um, you know, I just studied hard and didn't get into trouble. And I wanted, at that time, I wanted to save my virginity for when I got married. And to me, I thought the future was bright. I was on the right track, right? Well, when I was a junior, I started dating. And I had a steady girlfriend for, I dated her off and on for three and a half years from that point. Um, and I really thought I loved her. We did everything together. Um, you know, our relationship started to get deeper. And for us, the temptation for us to engage in premarital sex grew stronger. So strong at the point we just gave in. And through the next years, this be eight years, this became a major problem for me. I started to live a very unchaste life. Looking back, I realized that now I didn't really love her the way I should have. And, but I was enslaved to the sin of premarital sex in an unchaste lifestyle. And this included not just engaging in that, but also pornography and, you know, just very just unchaste. Um, and this, this started this downward spiral for me that led me to a life of living a lifestyle that was very destructive. Next picture. Now this one I have a title for. This is me in college. I call this type, this picture, fake news. <laughs> um, look at me. I got a smile. Look at that hair. I actually have hair. If you look real close, I have an earring there in my ear. Um, this is my college. This was when I was in college. Bud Light, my hand. Look how old that Bud Light bottle is. That's, that's old. Um, probably 1998, 97, maybe 1999. Um, Anyways, fake news. I, I look happy there, but on the inside I was miserable. And my college years were very destructive. I said I went to Wright State, I did for two years, but I ended up drinking my way out of it. And I'll go back to my talk and I'll tell you what happened. Um, and when I was in college, the girl I had been dating for three and a half years, we went our separate ways. And I started to drink alcohol heavily every day. 
I started to smoke pot and experiment with other drugs as well. I decided I wanted to be a party animal, to be the cool guy. <clears throat> I partied so much that after two years at Wright State, I quit and went to work full time, so I just had more money to party on. I jumped from relationship to relationship, from girl to girl, not caring if I hurt them. All I cared about was I wanted to take care of my wants and desires. And I spent most of my nights in bars, and I was several thousands of dollars in debt. So now, you guys are going to participate in my talk. What I want you all to do is I want you to close your eyes. Now, I promise you, you'll keep them closed until I tell you to open them, okay? I'm going to get a drink of water here. What we're going to do, we're going to do a small little meditation. I want you to meditate on is meditate on what I'm saying but also think of the time maybe when you were down in your life when you felt you were at the bottom so during this time my parents got divorced which multiplied the misery I got to a point where I was so I was unemployed for two months because I was in such a deep depression and I started to have suicidal thoughts. I knew this downward spiral would come to an end, but I was afraid it was at the cost of my life. There were many nights of rage and sorrow and a lot of soul searching because I had lost mine. And all I can say is that I was getting close to hitting rock bottom face first. When you're at the bottom, only one person can go deeper and lift you up. And open your eyes. The good Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, was at waiting for me. Waiting for me to reach to him. He sent into my life at that time an angel. And that angel is my wife, Melanie. This is a happy moment. This is my wife when she was, we met when I was, I was 22 and she was 18. She just graduated. So, um, how can you not fall in love with her? She's beautiful. Um, for me, it was love at first sight. She was beautiful, kind, friendly. She listened to me and all my troubles. She was from a good family. And I just felt better when I was around her. I wanted to be a better man for her. After three years of dating, we got married at St. Remy's. You know, looking back, when I first, you know, you saw, you see your wedding pictures, and I never, I think God has a sense of humor. And because at this time, I'm not Catholic. Okay, I, I don't even know if I really cared about God or anything like that, but he's right in the middle. And on our wedding day, I, I can say I've had maybe a couple spiritual moments that really like stand out to me. This is one of them. Not necessarily at this moment, but when I'm waiting down there and I see, and Father Hoying was our, uh, did this, the mass for our wedding. And when the doors open and it might have just been the sun was at the right spot, you know, coming through those. <laughs> it might have been that. Just saying. But when she showed up in the doorway there, it was like there was just this bright light around her. And to me, I was, I was just struck by it. I was just like, wow, this is a moment. Definitely a God moment for me. So, um, you know, we talked about our faith, different faiths at that time, and I just told her not to push me to become Catholic. It had to be something that was in my heart to do. And to be, to be honest, at that time, I had no intentions of ever becoming Catholic. Um, but on the other hand, I really did feel like I was filling that void that was in me, 
in my Lutheran faith or in the worldly things I was doing. Um, and since you know the Lutheran church I grew up in was about 20 minutes away from Rishi, I decided I'd go get my God time with my wife at Mass at Rishi. Um, it was closer and I could spend more time with her. And the funny part is, is that this time, and this man played a very instrumental part in my faith and me becoming Catholic. The weekend we got married was the first weekend that Father, how many of you know Father Amberger? Raise your hand. Okay. Father Amberger was the priest at St. Remy for 11 years. He was at Holy Angels and now he's down south. Um, anyways, his first weekend there was the weekend we got married. Um, of course, we couldn't have him do our wedding. We didn't know him. But instrumental that he came there at that time because I don't think I'd been Catholic if it wasn't for Father Amberger. And, you know, I sat there in the pews after, you know, the first couple Sundays after we got married, you know, that first month or so. And I started to feel something change in my heart. Um, even though I sat there and really didn't participate in the Mass per se, I started to pay attention during consecration and Holy Communion. I'd watch my wife go up to receive our Lord, and I'd start to feel this desire, this pull in my heart to want to join her. Something in my soul desired to receive the Eucharist, and I didn't even know it. You know, God was calling me, and like an amazing grace, I started my journey home, my journey to the church, the Catholic Church. Um, I decided to tell Melanie and her family I wanted to become Catholic. And when I told them this, I think their mouths got hit the floor. I don't think they ever thought that was going to happen. Um, you know, here's this man a few years back who said he was, I would even say I was anti Catholic. I argued with my Catholic friends till I was blue in the face. You know, and now I'm ready to learn what the church is all about. You know, I met with Father Amberger about this, and he had me attend the catechism class, which was taught by Dr. Mike Tarian, who um, he shared an office with Scott Hahn at Franciscan for a while, and he teaches seminary now. He was a great teacher. He just happened to be married to a Rushi girl, and was doing his dissertation, so he was in Rushi, and Father Amberger had him teach the class. Fell in love with the catechism in the church during this time. Um, started off my wife and the I would go to the classes on a Saturday morning, like early. She's 21 when we got married, I was 25. She didn't want to get up early on a Saturday morning. But I told her, I don't really know that many people from Rushi. Why don't you come with me just so I feel comfortable? That was the greatest decision we both made as a couple. Because it strengthened our, our marriage, definitely. And we both fell in love with the church. She's been a cradle Catholic. She was Catholic her whole life. And me being a convert. So, um, you know, I went to that class with an open heart and an open mind. I learned so many new wonderful things about my life, my faith, myself, and most importantly, my Lord. And never in my life did anything make more sense to me than the Catholic Church. All my misconceptions about Catholicism were thrown out the window. And I realized I grew up nothing, knew, knowing nothing about the saints, sacraments like confession, um, our Blessed Mother, whom I love very much. And I never knew a thing about the popes or church history, you know, the martyrs, you know, those who would die for their faith. And, you know, the rosary, I learned the rosary. Um, this is the rosary my wife gave me when I became Catholic. I still use it to this day. It's missing one bead right here in the cross. I hope that's not a sign. But <laughs> I, I still I still uh, use this a lot. This is my favorite rosary, and it it breaks every once in a while. But I will definitely keep fixing this one. This is the one I hope someday when I'm laying in a casket, I hope this is the one that's on my hands. Um, this is my wife's gift to me. Um, you know, so I learned about the rosary, which my wife taught me. Um, you know, there, there's so much I didn't know about the church and how beautiful it is. And, you know, I learned that this is our Lord's church, not my church, his church. 
And the most beautiful part is I get to adore and worship and receive our Lord, his very body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist every time I go. And, you know, when I was, say, your guys' age, maybe younger, I always, I always thought about, you know, what's going to happen when I get older? And around the age, I don't know if that, I felt like at the age of 25, I, that was this going to be the end for me? Or something drastic was going to happen? I always had this kind of feeling something would drastically happen at 25. And of course, that's the day, you know, I get married, or the time I get married, and the time I become Catholic. And, you know, I look at it, as at the age of 25, I did die. I died to this world and the way I was living my life. And I decided to live the way the Lord wants me to live it. I made Jesus the center of my life. My sponsor during confirmation, Dave Borchers, gave me some really good advice. He told me there comes a time when you stop living the life that you want to and the world wants you to, and you start living it the way the Lord wants you to. God wants you to be happy, not just in this life, but in the next. So on April 10th, 2004, one great moment. On April 10th, 2004, I was confirmed into the Catholic Church at the Easter Vigil. That day, the day I was confirmed, I considered the greatest day of my life. And during, during my time when I was struggling with my past sins and so forth, Dave was a great person to me. He let me just talk to him. And then Father Hamburger, he just became his Father Hamburger, if you know who he is. <laughs> just who he is. His presence just speaks holiness. And his piousness, I don't know if that's even a word, but how pious he was around the Eucharist showed me that. And when I served, I wanted to be like him as far as showing the reverence that our Lord deserved. And so to me, I look at that and it's just a beautiful moment. I mean, you know, I have hair. <laughs> I started losing it when I was that eight, that at there that time. I always blame my wife, but <laughs> she has nothing to do with it. It's hereditary. <laughs> you know, you know. I received the Eucharist for the first time in my life on that night. At that moment, you know, in, in that that hour. Well, you know, we all know the Easter Vigil is not an hour. <laughs> the most beautiful mass, though, you'll go to all year is definitely the Easter ritual. Um, and before that, I had my first confession, and boy, was it a long one. Um, I remember calling up Father Hamburger or talking to him, and he's like, "Okay, Matt, um, why don't we set up a date? You'll come in. I have an appointment at 7:30. Why don't you come in at 7:15?" And I looked at him, and I'm like. Father, is that going to be enough time? I have a lot of sins here to talk about. <laughs> and, I mean, you got to think about 25 years, and college was in that. My high school years were all in that. I went through the whole book. I mean, I, I probably... What a great blessing confession was. When I walked out of there that day, I felt like a completely new person. I'm not just saying that because our priests say that. I'm saying that because that's how I felt. That's how I felt in here. That's how I felt spiritually. Is that I'm a brand new person. You know, I just felt like the sins were just like boulders. You remember that chip I said I had on my shoulder? That came off. That big boulder was gone. You know, I look back on that day and I realized like the prodigal son, I finally come home. You know, the, the good shepherd went out and found his lost sheep. Our Heavenly Father was waiting for me to put peace at the altar, which is his only son. I stand before you today a humble man. I am a sinner, and I'm not worthy to stand in the presence of God, but he welcomes me with open arms. I find my refuge in the sacred heart of Jesus, and I find comfort in the arms of his mother, and my, his mother and my mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary.
for whom I'm consecrated to today. This is a picture of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, today, my wife and I are both consecrated to her through the Militia of Immaculata. Um, I'd highlight if you're not, maybe some of you already are, but who are not consecrated, that's definitely something I would do. There's many different groups. We are part of the Militia of Immaculata, or you might heard called MI. There's other groups in the area too, I'm sure are really good. We prefer the MI. <laughs> but anyways, um, one little story about my consecration and what our Blessed Mother has meant to me. Number one for me, struggling against impurity. There's no other better person to go to. But besides that fact, when my first couple years of being coming Catholic, I struggled with scrupulosity. I don't know if you know what scrupulosity is. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but if you want to know, look it up. I struggled with it, and um, our Blessed Mother, at about the time I went through my MI consecration, and I used to go to the, the if you ever seen the grotto, grotto outside St. Remy's Church, there's a little grotto to the side. I used to go there every time I was up to church, whether I was after religion, or just any time I was after, I always go there and pray, because I, scrupulosity can be very mentally um, painful. And she helped me, I felt like she was that mother to me to help me through that time of great anxiety, and just to help me understand that I am a child of God. And so the MI consecration really helped me with that. Many graces have come from that. Um, you know, and I look back and I think of all these things, and these things were great things that started a whole new life for me. And, but, you know, I did have all these past sins I had to deal with that, you know, whether it was my own conscious bringing up or my unwillingness to forgive myself. You know, I had, I went to confession, I repented, and I was starting to enjoy living the life of a Catholic, you know, being close to God in his church. Um, but from there, I needed a game plan. I just, it's nothing like, okay, here I am, now what? You need a game plan. And for me, that's when God brought back into my life someone that was very important to me as a kid, and that was Joseph. You know, I, I'm married, I got kids, and I just want to think, I want to be a good husband and a good father for them. And to me, there's no better example than St. Joseph. He was a man of faith. He followed whatever God told him to do. And he had to trust in God completely. Because he had to care for the Blessed Virgin Mary and the child Jesus. Those are some big shoes to fill. Think about it. From all eternity... God picked St. Joseph to watch over our Blessed Mother and his only son, Jesus. So to me, that's, that's very important. To me, it says that man is very important. Um, St. Joseph was a strong man, a carpenter by trade. He was a man of few words, but definitely a man of action. He protected his wife and child from harm. And in his silence, he showed humility. Like us, here is an ordinary man who is called to share in the life of the extraordinary. He was the chaste spouse of Mary. And he taught me a lot more about being chaste. He loved her very much, and he shows me how to treat my wife. He leads me to his wife and our mother, Mary. He leads me to our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the patron saint of the universal church. He is the patron saint of the worker. He is the patron saint of social justice. He is the patron saint of a happy death. So when he died, he died in the arms of Jesus and Mary. He helped raise Jesus as a baby to a young man. And he shows me how to be a good father to my children. And he is the head of the holy family. And I, I think especially in this time right now in our lives, and we look at what's happening, in the, especially in our country, and I think the biggest problem we have, and I'm speaking to you men right now, is we gotta be more like him. 
how many people in our society, especially our African American brothers and sisters that grow up with not a father in their home. We have to be the example. As men, we have to be like St. Joseph. And this is not just for the men, ladies too. I this lap right before the pandemic started, I went and did this consecration of St. Joseph. It's by Father Callaway. And if you had me in religion, you probably remember Father Callaway. I showed a video called No Turning Back. Father Callaway was this man was kicked out of Japan for being a very unruly. And some and he was complete part of my French, he's a hill jack. I mean, he's from the hills. Had knew nothing of Jesus or the church. And now he is, this is a great book, Champions of the Rosary is another book he wrote. Great books. This man, this is a great priest, but he talks about even a greater person. And this Consecration of St. Joseph is that book. I highly recommend you, men and women, to read this and to do the Consecration, plus the Marian Consecration. Why not? I mean, who, not, who doesn't want to be like the Holy Family? I mean, that's what our society needs now. Because we've got to remember what is sacred and what is holy and what is just. And St. Joseph is a great example of that. So I hope, I hope my story helps you realize how very important your Catholic faith is and how blessed you are to be Catholic. You belong to a church that is the spouse of our Lord and is the same as it was 2,000 years ago. You get to adore and worship our Lord and receive our Lord's true presence in the Eucharist. No religion or Christian denomination can tell you that. With the Holy Spirit as your guide, the saints like St. Joseph as your companion, Mary as your mother, Jesus as our Savior and King, how can we go wrong? And I'd like to close with the prayer to St. Joseph. So I know some of you guys said you had this book to do. <laughs> Turn to page 18, you can help me lead. So we're going to end with the prayer of St. Joseph. Um, I was telling one of the fellow guys here, <clears throat> to me, you have to have a game plan with your family. And many of you will become husbands, fathers, wives, mothers, and you'll have children of your own. You have to pass that on to them. Don't let society pass it on to them. You pass it on to them. You be the Saint Joseph. You be our Blessed Mother to them. You be the Holy Family. So to do that, you have to have a game plan. So my wife and I, every morning, for about 10 minutes, we get up and we, we have a intentions, daily intentions we pray for. We pray for a lot of people in the morning. Um, we also do some prayers, and Saint, the St. Saint Joseph prayer is one of them. And that night, we try to, try to do a rosary and a Divine Mercy Chaplet and some closing prayers. You have to pass it on to your kids. Don't, I'm begging you, don't let society do it. You guys do it. Be the saints to your kids and to those around you. Whoever you have an influence on, be that St. Joseph. Be St. whatever your name is to that person. So let's close with that prayer. Prayer to St. Joseph, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Joseph, Father and guardian of virgins, to his faithful keeping, Christ Jesus, and this is itself, and Mary, the Virgin of Virgins, were entrusted. I pray and beseech you by the twofold of his most precious charge, by Jesus and Mary, to save me from all uncleanness, keep my mind untainted, my heart pure, and my body chaste, and help me always to serve Jesus and Mary in perfect chastity. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.